Essential is working on a new phone. Also, Andy Rubin is still Andy Rubin. We should probably talk about that. This is the Android Police Podcast. It's Wednesday, October 9th. Welcome alongside uh, Ryan. I am David Ruddick. And joining us today is Baltimore's 98 Rock Listener of the Month and a managing editor for gaming at Mobile Nations, Russell Hawley. Hi. I'm not totally surprised that you tossed that in there, but sure. That was all jewels. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what it means. Um, for all I know, that could have been very insulting, but it's, nope. in the, it's in the queue, so I can't not say it. It could also just be completely made up. That's right. It could Bill's just made it up. It could. So um, today we're going to get started with like, the topic that really is kind of, I guess, trending and sorry about that, um, it, which is Andy Rubin and Essential. So let's start with the news side of the news first, <laughs> which is Essential. And by Essential, I mean Andy Rubin teased a new phone yesterday. And that phone is called Project Gem, G-E capital, capital M's. And they're very shiny and also... They look like somebody sliced an iPhone four in half um, and then covered in iPod Nano Paint, and it's it's, it's interesting um, as a piece of technology. But I think the discussion that we're going to have today <laughs> is oh, it's it's a minefield. Um, but I've already have I've already done that on on the website, so I can't not do it now on the show. Well, let's let's but, talk about the weirdo phone first before we. Okay, yeah, let's talk about there, the weirdo. There phone. are a couple of really fascinating and also terrible things about this phone. Yeah, it looks like a fancy remote control. I think it does. I I, I stared at it for a couple minutes, and like the video was you know very pretty that that got shared. the The backs are you know shiny backs. You either care about that or you don't. Uh, but then I caught the navigation for the phone is up where the camera is. It's got a hole punch camera. And then if you look at one of the shots that Ruben shared, the back button is up at the top of the phone next to the front facing camera. Yeah. So that, so I feel like that might be something specific to the, the app. Like there, like, uh, like on iOS apps have back buttons sort of up in the corner. That might be some element of their skin. That might not be like the entire system navigation. I can't imagine how anybody would think that's a good idea. But I mean, I mean it, even, like, the entire interface. Moving weird. your UI around like that is also kind of a bad idea. Yeah, that there's no way this can render a standard Android app correctly. I mean, it's so right. it's so narrow. Nothing is going to look right. I can't imagine Google even certifying this for for Google Apps because nothing will look right. No, and I don't think they will. I mean, so one of the things Ron Amadio pointed out was that uh, it's running uh, basically an app that is sourcing data from open street maps for navigation, which will, mm. I'm sure, work very well um, and not be a disaster at all in any way. But we just, we don't know much about what this product's kind of positioning is, I guess, is a thing. Is this actually intended to replace your smartphone? Or is this a weirdo sidekick device that's like trying to say, well, you know, smartwatch is too limited, smartphone too much, you know, Goldilocks middle, good. Like, um, a, like a palm phone from Essential. Yeah. And so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what kind of segment they're looking at there. It's like a, it's a lifestyle phone. It's a smart home remote. <laughs> not actually a phone at all. This is actually the essential home. That's right. He's yep. Before. It's actually oh, it's the essential home. I forgot about that. That was definitely a thing for like a minute um, <laughs> that didn't happen. So the phone itself, we don't, we really don't know much about it. Andy Rubin was basically tweeting teaser photos from what was probably like a batch of prototypes that arrived at the essential or playground office or whatever. And those are just probably, you know, they're running firmware that's not ready yet. Who knows when this phone would even come out? If it even comes out, I don't think it's guaranteed that it will, um, especially with Essential being a startup that is totally 100% VC funded. Um, but when I started looking at them, a my response was, okay, this looks kind of bad. Uh, but then it was, it, it quickly became like, wait, why are we talking about Essential in this way where they have like, we're giving them a lot of credit and specifically the credit is going to them because Andy Rubin is the guy pulling the strings over there and the guy who is making these ideas a reality. I don't think anybody has any illusions about essential being basically Andy Rubin's like personal toy factory. You know, they make things that he wants to make. They realize the vision, but it's Andy's vision. And I think that was clear from the PH one as well. 
Yeah, I, absolutely. There's there's no there's no question that that you know nothing about the essential products that have been teased so far uh, and and the one that has been released uh, were anything other than stuff that Andy Rubin thought was important. Even down to the pogo pins on the back of the phone uh, for for the original essential phone that didn't end up really ever doing much of anything. Like that that's been Andy Rubin's thing for a decade now. Is let's put pogo pins on everything. He does love pogo pins. So. And that's when, for me, the discussion kind of shifted to, well, we're are we just going to sign off and get hype about like Andy Rubin's new thing, which is what it is. You know, you can call it an essential product, but essential exists because of Am Andy Rubin. And in a way where it exists far more than Apple existed because of Steve Jobs, unless we're going back way to the 80s. Yeah. Like essential, we'd have to go way back. Essential has done nothing that is relevant of, of coverage in its own right. Like they made a mediocre phone and they've been updating that phone for two years and doing basically nothing else. And essentially it's, it's basically Andy Rubin's ego is what this company is. It, it is and that's entirely. So he has something to do to make him feel important. Exactly. And so when I started like thinking about that, I was like, well, you know, last year there was this little story might've read it um, in the New York times about the fact that Andy Rubin was paid basically $90 million in what is colloquially being called hush money. Um, I can't say that's a fact as to what it was, but if you look at the story the New York Times created, I wouldn't say created, investigated surrounding the circumstances of receiving that money and Andy Rubin's departure from Google, it becomes pretty hard to argue it was anything but hush money. And when you look at the circumstances, why he was given this massive payout, truly huge amount of money. Um, well, the New York Times does not really gloss over the the details on this. It's it's pretty uh, pretty gross, actually, in most ways. And the more I thought about that, the more I realized, like, why am I like giving this guy's company credit for doing anything like it is just his company and he's the person making these products happen and here we have this story about this guy that was very very controversial at the time it was published and now there seems to be you know kind of a knee-jerk happening where everybody's just like well new product cool it's awesome let's look at it it's interesting it's different and i think that attitude toward technology is i i don't want to say it's hard to understand. I understand why people do it. It's easy to separate the individual from the product. You know, we do it every day. When you hold an iPhone, you know, Tim Cook may well have put it in his hand on stage, but you don't like pick up your iPhone and think of Tim Cook. That's, <laughs> that's not the way people relate with their products. But I think we have to realize as, you know, people who cover the space that in certain cases, a person really is a product in a lot of way in certain situations. And I think essential is one of the the most just perfect examples of this right now in in the space, especially for the amount of attention it gets. And the attention it gets is because Andy Rubin runs the company and they are his ideas. That is why they receive attention. And so it becomes time to reconcile. We look at the story about Andy Rubin that was published last year in the Times, and we look at Essential as a company and their products. I don't see any way to separate Andy Rubin from Essentials products. They are really intrinsically entwined in a way that Google or Samsung or Huawei, any of these other big companies, that's just not how their products exist. That's not how they're perceived. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's right. It's also important to keep in mind that we have the reverse of this conversation all the time. Like when when uh, when someone prominent leaves HTC or or Google or, or any of these other companies, there's there's this kind of knee jerk reaction to you know this company is doomed now because this this luminary from this company is left and and frequently people in our position have to go no there are literally hundreds of people involved in making these products and these decisions don't come from uh you know the a single person's mind it, essential does not work that way it is first of all i don't i don't think there are 10 whole people who work for essential right now last time i checked yep, they've, they've had um, a lot of layoffs Right. So, I mean, when it, it is it is wildly different from that perspective as well. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind that this is the first thing that we've seen from Andy Rubin, essentially, since the New York Times story went up. He went completely silent yeah. when the and New York the Times story went up. response to that story was really, I think, troubling in its own right. right. Like he just came off as like entirely dismissive of even the idea that he could be accused of something like that. I mean, and it's there are a lot of really troubling accusations. And he just said, nope. None of it happened. Absolutely not. It was just, it, you know, didn't didn't sit right with me at the time. 
No, and it didn't with me either. And I think that speaks to some of this is some of this is I would say, you know, we've seen I personally have heard rumors over the years about and these are in the New York Times story, by the way, that Andy Rubin is a micromanager, um, that he is an extremely controlling boss and that he's not very nice to his employees. And I don't think being a bad boss is like an indictment of who you are as a human being necessarily. But it's also like one of those situations where you look at, well, you've got this stuff in your HR record. Um, it didn't just appear there by magic. Um, you know, if, if there are, you have things in your personnel file that go like show significant complaints lodged against you, for example. Well, at a certain point, do you believe the person who's been accused multiple times of having done things that have affected uh, the workplace? Or do you believe the people who are com making the complaints against him? And I think that's in the time we are right now, we are seeing a shift in how people look at those things. I mean, if you're the person who's the, on the receiving end of or who's being complained about frequently, I mean, are we really going to probably go in your direction when you die and say, no, people are just out to get me. The people are just out to get me defense is getting pretty tired these days. And yeah. Andy Rubin didn't do much to make his case. He did like it was literally those two tweets. That was it. And then he went silent for a year. Yeah, I mean, and Google's, I mean, Google's position, I think, for a long time has been really troubling, too, with with Andy Rubin, people like Andy Rubin, they seem very committed to the idea that there are just special people who will do amazing things for the company, and they need to be protected. I think they've been called like aberrant geniuses in, in various media reports, which is it's such a silly concept to me. Like, I mean, Andy Rubin founded Android and almost immediately was bought by Google. And you know, and Android became a big thing because of Google's resources. And I think if you look back, like the last year Andy Rubin really had control over Android is when we were in like the Jelly Bean Kit Kat era. And since he left, I think it's pretty clear Android's gotten a lot more competitive and better as a platform. I don't think that he's, you know, uh, like a, a tech luminary. I think he was in the right place at the right time. I mean, the creation of Android, I mean, can largely be attributed to him um, with uh, with danger. I mean, of course, he had help. But Android is one of those examples that I think where you can versus essential. So one of the things that people undoubtedly, you know, will eventually come to us with is, well, Andy Rubin created Android. Are you going to stop using Android because Andy Rubin made it? And that's one of those situations where you have to say, well, is Andy Rubin Android? And when last was Android Andy Rubin? Maybe around the time it got bought by Google, maybe I don't and even it, know how much as, he really controlled that. And like one. as a platform at the time, like it was totally different than even the Android we got in two thousand eight. It was like it, it was like a BlackBerry competitor. Yeah, exactly. Google had very different vision for Android at that time, and Andy Rubin honestly did not last long as the I the leader, let's say, not dictator of the Android group at Google. He. I think, you know, decided that he wanted to do something else and they let him go buy a bunch of robotics companies that didn't work out at all. And so I think that, you know, saying that like, oh, well, Android and Andy Rubin, Essential and Andy Rubin, it's a very false equivalency. You, you, they just aren't, they aren't relatable. Android has become so much more than what Andy Rubin's Android ever was. And I don't associate Android with Andy Rubin any more than I associate like, you know, I would say the modern United States system of government with George Washington. Like, yeah, he was a big part of it, but like, are you going to say that George Washington intrinsically defines the way we govern the United States of America today? No, it's somebody has become so separated. They're a piece of history at that point. Andy Rubin is a piece of Android's history. He doesn't define it. And it's not clear that he ever did. Well, and to to your point, it's the the parts that he defined were not necessarily software. You, you take it farther back to danger, you know, the the things that the sidekick accomplished in its time were, were all spectacular hardware accomplishments. It was it was, you know, changing challenging what we viewed as a form factor that was useful in those in those uh, situations. But the software really wasn't all that spectacular. It was still pretty far behind what BlackBerry was at the time. And moving that forward into the first version of Android, the the concepts behind what became the G1 were incredible for the time. Uh, but but the solutions that came from it from a software perspective were were not altogether spectacular. And so moving forward required other visions. So I, I disagree that he was responsible for Android from a software perspective as much as he was from a hardware one. 
Interesting. Yeah, it's one of those pieces of history, Android's history, that I'm not incredibly familiar with. I know that like he was a piece of something, and I know Danger was really focused on um, on hardware as far as he went. But that's that's an interesting thing to know. So um, this kind of leads us to the post we put on the website this morning um, that I wrote up for us was. So Android Police as a publication, you know, when we look at Essential and we look at like, you know, what's been put out there about Andy Rubin, um, his response to it, and also where where we stand with them in terms of like as a company, you know, what do what do we think their their role is in the ecosystem? And there there are a lot of things that go into it, but I just knew, you know, at a certain point, like when I thought about it last night. I couldn't in good conscience, like walk into an essential press conference anymore. I would just feel like I am taking this person's essentials, spending money to get this attention. They're spending money to court journalists. All companies do this. And generally speaking, I have no problem with that. But when I look at the history with Andy Rubin and when I look at what happened, you know, and how the response to it went, and then the response to the new device yesterday, I felt icky. I just really felt grossed out. And I knew that, you know, I don't, I knew at that point, I don't want anything from this company. I don't want to take anything that they're offering. And I mean, I articulated this much better in our post, frankly, definitely getting a little nervous having to talk about such a controversial topic on a podcast as compared to, you know, having time to really lay out my thoughts and writing. But I came away very certain that I would in no way regret or feel controver- feel controversy about our decision there. And I can't, you know, speak to uh, other people's decisions. I can say that, you know, I've been reached out to by several publications and I won't name names, but several publications are telling me we're strongly considering doing the same thing. Do I think a bunch of publications are going to do it? I don't know. Um, I, I can understand that for other businesses, you know, they have different concerns and I'm not going to shame anybody for not doing what we have decided to do. That's, that's not productive. It's not constructive, but I, I hope that what we published has started conversations and from what I'm hearing it has. So that's been encouraging to me. Yeah, I, so, I think at the end of the day, you have to really take a look at, uh, at, at, you know, what kind of decision is being made there, right? Like you you have to think more about the the audience that's receiving it. And the people who are excited about the essential phone should know more about the stuff that it came from because this is not this is not a normal uh, company. You know, so it, it it definitely makes sense to to take that approach, I think. Yeah, I think we should we should also make clear like we're not saying that we're gonna pretend that essential literally does not exist. We're we're just we're not going to work with them on on things that we normally would with other country uh, other companies. Exactly. We're we're definitely basically so to clarify our official position here. We won't be going to any press conferences. We won't be accepting any briefings, any review units, anything under embargo, anything that would constitute access above and beyond what somebody on the internet can get by going to their official press website or being on an email list. Um, that's that's all we're willing to do. Um, we will also, if we, if there ever becomes a situation where we need to send them an inquiry through press, you know, we will deliberate that, you know, very like strongly, and will be done at a high level, um, deciding when or if we want to communicate with them and when it's necessary. We will still cover news about Essential. That's that's still on the table. I don't know if we'll review their phone. I I still have to. There's a lot of there's going to be a lot of discussion about that in terms of why we want to review it, what our motivations are, what the value to the audience is, and also really what our reviewing the phone, you know, does in terms of for essential, how it gives them um, legitimacy and, you know, promotes their brand, which are valid concerns as well. And I've, I've heard people bring this up. And that's not to say that one side or the other has a clear advantage in my mind at this point. I We really do need to think about this. For now though, um, it's fairly clear that Essential got the message. <laughs> Andy Rubin uh, blocked me on Twitter as of this morning. So fair to say we will have no access whatsoever going forward, sure. which I'm fine yeah. with. Um, I didn't do this skip blocked by Andy Rubin. I didn't do this for attention. I really did want to generate a conversation. I guess I did it for attention in that sense. I want attention drawn to the issue. I want people to talk about it. I want people to remember that this story, which happened a year ago, is still a thing and was never resolved in a satisfactory manner. Essentially, Andy Rubin that made a statement and decided, I'm pretty sure that'll be dead by the next time uh, I'm doing something that matters. 
And I don't think it should be. I think it should be brought back up and I think it should be, and it will be included in every single piece of coverage we have about essential. We will be linking to our a policy about essential and why we have it. You brought it up. So I had to go and look and he blocked me too. Nice. <laughs> I guess he's going on a block spree or his PR person is. Yeah. I'm probably, Although I doubt Andy Rubin would let somebody control his Twitter account. Yeah. I, I complain too, but I don't think I'm important enough to get blocked. I haven't looked though. Yeah. So uh, that that was, uh, I wouldn't say validation to get blocked by Andy Rubin, but it was acknowledgement that um, I can say that our policy of uh, not having access, we will definitely not be afforded any. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know that it could get, oh, there are so many people, don't get me wrong. We've heard the criticism and some of it is, I understand some people's points, other people's points are total false equivalency. And I think that going through those is not worth our time. Simply a lot of discussion about, well, if you're doing this, the biggest one that I think people want to see addressed, and we will talk about this one for just a few minutes, is, well, if you're going to boycott Essential, which we're not boycotting Essential, and everybody's saying we're boycotting them, we're not boycotting them. The only thing we're boycotting is special access from them. We are not boycotting covering their products. That's not something we're doing. We just don't want anything from them. We don't want them to give us anything. That's all. But the the question being asked is, well, if you're doing this to Essential, you know, Google is the one who paid Andy Rubin $90 million. Why aren't you talking about like what you're going to do to Google over this? And I think we all have some thoughts about why this is a false equivalency, because I, I do believe strongly that it is. Yeah. Google, so if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and start with this one. I mean, Google Google is not one guy. Google is, is a faceless corporation that has a lot of people working for it. And the decision to give Andy Rubin all that money was probably wrong. Uh, but we can't just like say all of Google is responsible for the way Andy Rubin behaves. So like, I mean, it, it, you know, pretending that we should, you know, behave the same way toward Google in this situation, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Google as a singular organization should absolutely be held accountable on multiple occasions for some of the things that it has done at a corporate level. And this is something that Ryan brought up earlier. This, this is not a isolated incident. Uh, on, on Google's behalf when it comes to, you know, silencing something to, to get, you know, in, in ahead of a news story uh, in order to, to make something happen. And there should absolutely be a larger conversation about how Google is discussed uh, in these uh, contexts. That having been said, uh, what happened here did not come from the Android team. It, it came from the, you know, it came from what is now Alphabet. Uh, you know, and and that is something that has to be kept in mind. Is that these are these are now entirely separate, massive organizations, uh, and and there's a, a larger kind of constant conversation regarding, uh, you know, repeated failed uh, attempts to claim that they have increased diversity efforts, or, uh, you know, how um, employee groups have been treated when when trying to you know do anything uh, regarding. Uh, things like Google's involvement in the military and, and you know, some of the other, uh, you know, kind of very public things that have happened uh, between Google and its and its employees. Like this is this is something that, in my personal opinion, doesn't get covered enough by tech sites because it's difficult for tech sites to look at this and go, well, is this actually tech? Uh, and, and that's a that's kind of a larger industry conversation. But I, I do feel it's one worth having. But that's not the same thing as let's boycott Google because this happened. Yeah, right. there, there are so many people at Google who are agitating for change. They're like, they're, they're staging protests against things like this and like punishing everybody who works for Google by like, you know, boycotting them over Andy Rubin doesn't feel right to me. No, and I think pointing out the protests that happened at Google, the walkouts, if you understand the kind of company Google is, if you understand the kind of people who work there, a walkout at Google is a pretty big deal. Uh, Google has long generated this kind of view of, you know, harmony internally. Everybody who works there has this very, let's all get along. Let's all work on our own thing and be supportive to each other when it's necessary. There is a very Googly attitude, despite what some high level Google people may say. There is still that attitude at Google. And I think we've all worked with people at Google before. And we understand that attitude pretty well. So for me, for people inside Google to organize and decide like, hey, we are not okay with the decision regarding what happened with Andy Rubin, and we are all going to walk out on our jobs for a day, that's a pretty big deal at Google. That's not a very Google thing to do. Yeah, I mean, this is a company who, that will spend unreasonable amounts of money to feed people awesome food so they don't leave. 
the building. Yeah. Like they, they want you to be there all the time. They do. And I think the the takeaway for, for me there is Google did at that point, Sundar Pichai went on the record and said, okay, we're going to make some changes regarding reporting, sexual harassment. But at that point, I think the, the biggest thing that would happen is the awareness of the shift in attitude around sexual harassment at Google that would probably be present going forward, that there would be taken be taken more seriously. Um, I don't think that absolves Google's uh, board of directors of any blame for what they did with Andy Rubin in regard to his exit package. That was a decision made by C-level executives. That was such a payout. People had to sign off on that. I'm sure Larry Page had to sign off on that. I'm sure Sundar Pichai had to sign off on that. Those people, you know, in their roles as executives have to make difficult decisions. I vehemently disagree with them on that decision. They should have fired Andy Rubin, without a doubt. They were afraid of getting sued. That's what it came down to. They didn't want to have all this dirty laundry aired. Who knows what Andy's got on them that he could fire off. Google hates confrontation. That is a huge part of their corporate culture. They really, really don't like it. And I think that their response there was a major moral and corporate failing on their part. They showed that they were willing to roll over. And yeah. I, I really do disagree with them on that. Yeah, I mean, and, and unfortunately, I, I don't think that kind of behavior is really even unique to Google. I mean, I've worked for companies uh, like, you know, when I had regular jobs in the past that behaved in, in similar ways, honestly. Uh, but it's amplified with Google because it's such a huge company. They have so much money to throw around and they're, and they're so like, uh, you know, in the public consciousness. I mean, I'm sure smaller scale versions of this are happening right now in, in uncountable companies across the country and the world. Definitely. So I think that kind of sums up why we don't believe that, you know, boycotting Google um, in some kind of way would be an effect, A, an effective tool or B, a proportionate response. I mean, what Andy Rubin is accused of is a very personal allegation. Let's be clear about that. Personal allegations. Um, what Google has done is in is a case of basically a corporate issue. It's um, bad management. It's not it is. A, a crime against another human being. Yes, alleged crime. We have to say alleged. Everything's alleged. And, you know, as a publication, I do want to make clear, we're not we're not saying whether Andy Rubin did what uh, his accuser said he did. We That's not a stance for us to take. We can all have our personal beliefs about that. And I think it's perfectly appropriate to have your own opinion about that. But I think um, everyone can and should do better on these kinds of things. And I, I think that bringing Essential to task over this, because it is Andy Rubin's company, I think it's important. I think it will send the message. And in the tech media, too often, we do see people roll over for the sake of access. And I, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not singling anybody out here. I, I'm sure we have done the same in the past, um, without a doubt. But on this one, I felt it was pretty clear cut um, as to why accepting that access felt gross. And I hope that um, some other organizations have some some serious discussions about uh, about why you know that's uh, why that's something worth talking about. And with that very light subject out of the way, I'm going to roll an advertisement for <laughs> very quickly for ourselves. Um, hey, you want a special emoji of Ryan absolutely losing his mind? Losing his mind? <laughs> uh, I'll try this again. Hey, you want a special emoji of Ryan absolutely losing his mind? You want more entries into AP's giveaways? You want to support our podcast, which we're doing three times a week now, by the way, plus the Q&A show on Tuesdays? The best way you can do that is get the best perks ever and to subscribe to the Android Please podcast on Twitch. Plants are just $5 a month, but if you have an and Amazon Prime account, you can subscribe to our Twitch feed for free, and it helps support the show when you subscribe, by the way. You don't spend any money, but it helps support us financially when you subscribe on Twitch. And also, you get a special little piece of bling in the chat room. You come talk with us. We do pay attention to the people who have the little subscriber star. Um, you can ask questions and hang out and stuff, and it's a good time. So once again, that's twitch.tv slash androidpolice. Um, thanks for listening. Ryan, you want to lead in on this one? Sure. OK, so uh, a lot of Android OEMs are really pushing 5G phones. I mean, Samsung has, has, has gone so far as to release specific pieces of hardware with 5G capabilities just to get it out there. Google has not really done that. Uh, Apple, of course, is not. Uh, but apparently, there may be a 5G pixel in the not too distant future. Uh, so a report from the Nikkei says that uh, a 5G test phone is in, in production for Google. Uh, and it might be released next week, supposedly, but uh, that sounds mm, that sounds sketchy to me. I don't think that we'll hear about the, a 5G Pixel 
next week. But I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in the not too distant future, Google does start selling the 5G Pixel. I would imagine probably in a partnership with Verizon. Uh, I, 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 just don't, I, don't, I don't think it's good. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's the right time. If Google's just doing this as like a test device just to get out there and try millimeter wave and stuff and understand it from kind of that scientific googly perspective, okay, mm -hmm. whatever. The idea, the Nikkei report says that they could either launch it alongside the Pixel phones next week, which I think is highly unlikely. Yeah. We would have heard about it because it would almost certainly be on Verizon. And I think we would have seen leaks. There would have been leaks of this if it was coming on Verizon. Um, if it's coming next spring, which Nikkei indicates is also a possibility, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. Why would you do that? Why would you go and say, like, we're going to release a kind of better version of the phone we came out with six months ago, and it's got 5G, and it's just that to I, I, me. I think well, the only way that works is if, if there's a carrier who's committed to pushing the right. I mean, and, Verizon, and it would be really big on 5G. It would be Verizon. It would have to be, it would be Verizon. Verizon. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's, I mean, there's no way that Verizon, Verizon didn't say that. That Verizon didn't go, hey, you should make a 5G version of this. Like that that's 100 percent how that goes down. Yeah, basically. I mean, but I mean it, it's if if it's another millimeter wave phone, it's like it, it's useless. There's no reason to just buy a phone that only supports millimeter wave. It it works almost no place. And even when you're in a place that has millimeter wave 5G, it is an atrocious experience. Yeah, it's not good. It's getting better. Um, I will say that I went to Qualcomm's 5G day and I did try out millimeter wave that works around corners now, um, which how, is how, how did it do that? I wonder, did they explain the, the they science? They did. So it's actually it's it's basically just reflectance. Um, so it can bounce mm -hmm. off of glass, metal, certain types of concrete, I think. So mm -hmm. it does work. Yet it is like, and so the reason they say it doesn't work in some implementations right now is because like the firmware of the small cells not set up to do the beam forming stuff yet. I don't know. Anyway, I saw that it does work, but I still think buying a millimeter wave phone, even for the entirety of 2020 is a bad idea. I just would never recommend it. Even 2021, I'm not sure. Will millimeter waves stick around for the long term? I don't know. Qualcomm really seems to think it will. And it's the only appreciable 5G in the United States aside from Sprint's uh, 2.5 gigahertz network right now, which is the only mid-band network we have and we'll have for this foreseeable future because the FCC is dumb. But I don't, unless unless Google did a 5G version of the Pixel on Sprint, that, was the, that would be the one where I'd be like, okay, that kind of makes sense. Any other carrier? Nope. Well, but with Sprint's like impending T-Mobile merger, I feel like it, like buying a, a Sprint phone is maybe not the best idea anyway. If that merger even happens. I mean, they're getting sued by basically half of the states. I, I, I don't know that that's going to roll through so easily. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, th so Verizon has, hasn't even talked about what it wants to do for, for low band 5G. Um, T-Mobile has talked a little bit about it. Um, but I mean, I think that's like when when we see what low band 5G actually is capable of, then you'll be able to sort of form your opinions on whether or not you care about a 5G phone. But a millimeter okay. wave 5G phone is just like, give me a break. And on low band 5G, by the way, at and and Verizon, their strategy, and they've, they've stated this now on financial and analyst calls, is to do what's called spectrum share with LTE which is where they take some of their low band spectrum in like six, seven, eight, nine hundred megahertz, and they refarm that to 5G, but it can simultaneously still be used for LTE. So you're not getting any more bandwidth. You are just sharing that spectrum among 4G and 5G users, and you're gaining a little bit of spectral efficiency for 5G because of the new waveform that 5G uses. It's a little more spectrally efficient. And you're eventually trying to get to the point where you'll have a 5G standalone network where you'd be able to go from, you know, the low frequency 5G to the um, high millimeter, the millimeter wave, and eventually the mid-band stuff. But there is very, very, very little reason to believe that these spectrum share 5G networks are going to provide an appreciably better end user experience. We're talking incremental gains, low double digit percentages, maybe on speed, 20, 30 yeah. percent, if that. I mean, an LTE is like, it's really good now. I mean, when I remember when I was, um, I was, I was using a Verizon 5G thing in, in Minneapolis a while back. And I was and and I was having a hard time like staying connected to 5G, obviously, because as soon as you turn a corner onto a street that doesn't have like 
an antenna like in in you know line of sight you you lose 5g but i was like hey i'm still getting like 200 megabits down on lte like that is fine with me totally um but i want to move on to our next topic on the show um the whole pixel 5g thing we'll see what happens i it's nikkei is like their rumors are who knows but the reason I wanted to have Russell on the show today before we had the whole essential like, you know, <laughs> thing, um, let's talk about wearables. And Ryan, you know, you're very experienced with like the larger portfolio of wearable technology right now, too, because I've been wearing an Apple Watch for the last like two weeks now. And I, I feel now a hostage to my iPhone because of the watch. Yeah. And yeah. it's it's a problem i think that that's, so, that honestly is like concerning to me like every time i think i should i should try an apple watch just so i understand it better I'm like but i don't want to get i don't want to like i don't want to get into it you know so russell i would love to hear from you what you think makes the apple watch experience so like industry leading which is my opinion at this point as well no yeah, i i completely agree and honestly it, it comes down to just a level of polish that is missing in android wear and samsung's uh platforms uh you know it it really is uh, just a degree of control, which is a funny thing, given how much little con how little control I feel like I have when using an iPhone. I have the right. opposite experience when using an Apple Watch. Like the amount of uh, noise that comes to my wrist, I have a lot of very easy, simple control over. Uh, the the differences in how notifications are received. If I get a message from uh, iMessage, for example, it, it pings my wrist in a different vibration pattern than some of the other things. So if I if I get a message from someone, I know exactly what that message is going to be before I even lift my wrist up. Um, uh, very simple things like uh, uh, digital touch um, are weird little things when you're communicating with people that, that just kind of add a little bit of personality. Um, I, I made fun of Apple hardcore for the whole put two fingers on your phone and be able to send someone your heartbeat. Let me tell you something. It, uh, it's actually really kind of endearing when you have someone that appreciates receiving that on the other end. It's a weird thing to get excited about. Um, but also like the, the whole Apple's whole switch to this being a fitness tracker uh, works. You know, as as much as the other fitness things that that try to do fitness tracking uh, function, this is not a thing that I have to think about um, from an analytical perspective. It's like when you put on a Fitbit, it tells you this you you've completed this gauge and that ten thousand steps, or you've completed this thing and you've gone up you know twenty steps or you know twenty flights of stairs. You like it gives you the the numbers right there. This removes that from from the experience and it's just you completed the blue ring, you completed the yellow ring, you completed the red ring. And th that is, those are abstract concepts. Those are, those are not tied to, like, you can go and look. I know that if I complete the red ring according to this thing, I've burned 750 calories. But that's, like, I went and did that work. No normal person is going to put this on and go, I know what that means. Uh, and that's, that makes it easier to not think about it as a, as a cheating thing. Because, like, you put on it, like, so many people put on a Fitbit and they go, oh, I got to, like, walk around for five minutes to, to complete my thing for the day. And I, you don't see nearly as many people do that with Apple Watch. Uh, so like it, it's just a it's not one one primary thing. It's a bunch of little polished things that come together that just make it really stand out. Even though I I don't like how it looks, it's still a square watch. Oh, I, I love I love the way it looks. I on okay maybe uh, I have different different watch aesthetics that I appreciate, but I, I agree with you. The holistic health approach to the Apple Watch is what is at this point to me. Nobody else is. I, I've looked at the Fitbit and I'm like, well, that doesn't actually look very appealing to me unless you're like Fitbits are great for like crazy stats nerds. Like if you really right. want to get in yeah. there, like on the web interface and like just look at graphs and yeah. everything. They, they, and they apply numbers to things that don't make sense. Like they give you sleeping scores. Like what is that? Like what is what is this number that you're telling me? I about don't understand sleep? that either. I don't I don't need any device to tell me how I slept. Trust me. I know. And fun fact, um, most of that is nonsense science. Yeah, I haven't seen anything about that. Sleep tracking yeah. on your wrists, especially if you sleep with another person in your bed, is is just nonsense. Yeah. So what I've found so far, like I agree with you, Russell, that the the rings approach to activity tracking is novel, and it it, it really is it it's approachable in a way that anybody can do it. They can understand it fairly quickly what it all means. I do think the stand experience needs to be explained a little better um because for the first two days i wore it i'm like i've been standing for like you know nine hours um what do you want from me right. um, like but yeah. there, there are little things you just kind of have to learn what to me has really been the standout thing is it mostly does everything i there haven't been many cases where i've looked at the watch and i'm like oh well it just doesn't do that you know um setting time all the stuff android wear does to a lot of it 
I feel the experience on the Apple Watch. For example, I don't like Siri, but when you hold down the crown, it starts listening immediately and responds mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah, no it delay. Is so fast with Android Wear, that has been. I'm going to keep calling it Android Wear because I always forget what it is. But um, it, that is, experience has always been terrible. So setting timers, um, looking up the weather, things like that. Uh, the other thing is the interface. To me, the interface on the Apple Watch is incredibly mature. It knows exactly what it wants to be. Yeah. So I love, you know, I have like the the standard complication face with like you know the four corners and then the four like inner dials yep. and all of that. And it sounds like a lot of information. You think of it, it's like oh, it's so much stuff. It's like no, it's all perfectly readable. I, uh, so it's funny you say that because it it works. That works really well for like the way your brain works and the way my brain works. I actually uh, set my girlfriend up with an Apple Watch not long ago, and I was like, here, check out this watch face. It's really super cool. And she looked at me and was just like, I can't read any of this. Get this off of my, like, I can't, this is oh, all terrible. I can't deal with this. I and love she, it. she went with an entirely different watch face. And it's really funny to see how many people react differently to that. I dig it, especially since the, the, the inner gauge and outer gauge, I just filled a lot of them with nonsense. Uh, Cause you can, one of them is really just the planetary alignment in the solar system right now. And every <laughs> once in a while, I just look down and go, that's kind of cool. I know where Saturn is uh, <laughs> totally useless. Like, you know, not, not nearly as functional as like, you know, being able to hit messages or like the weather or anything like that, but it's, it's just a cool thing. I, I, I mean, they are, they're a cool thing. So, I mean, I've got minor, like the top left is the UV rating today. Like, do I need to wear sunscreen top right is weather um, in the middle? I've got the calendar. I've got the battery. I've got the local clock and the compass now, because I'm wearing series five, I'll probably remove the compass because it seems pretty useless, but, um, and then the outer ones, you know, I've got the activity rings and the timer one, which I don't use very much, Tell but you, man, go with the solar system. You won't be disappointed. Yeah, I, I might go with the solar <laughs> system as the new one, but I just love also the other thing is the notification experience on, on Apple watch. Like you said, with the vibrations that you can customize and know yeah. exactly what talking to you. That's amazing. The tap engine is a revelation on the Apple Watch. We can talk about the app, the Taptic engine being so good on iPhone, which it is. It's still industry leading. But on the Apple Watch, it's, it, to me, an experience game changer. It totally changes how you interact with the product. Like, if I'm using navigation, which Android or Wear OS has too, but on Apple Watch, when I need to turn, it makes a blinker noise on the watch. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love it. It's so good. And now we just need to change lanes. It does a much shorter noise. Like, to know me, I just, or like, I need to just, uh, like, keep a certain direction. It's so much more instructive because for me, I don't really look at my phone screen when I'm navigating. I rely on audio cues only usually. And so when I get those little suggestions from the watch, I'm like, okay, I know I need to do something here soon. It's time to pay attention again um, because I have nowhere I can mount a phone in my tiny car. <laughs> that's really the, that's really why. But um, there's other things too, like um, responding to messages. I've actually found myself doing that in the Apple Watch. I trust it in terms of like the way it displays the information, what you're going to send, how quickly it responds, that I'm not going to have a basically the number of times on Wear OS over the years I had experiences where I went to perform an action and it just failed. Right. That was mm -hmm. the most frustrating thing. And that just makes you not want to use the product. Yeah. The Apple Watch, the only thing I've really had fail, honestly, is the Spotify controls. Um, and that's yeah. just because Spotify is hot garbage. You well, know? <laughs> Spotify, yeah. Spotify has trouble staying connected every once in a while. I do. Um, my only other real complaint when it comes to a UI is uh, the quick replies, I'm so spoiled by Android's quick reply system yes. and how intuitive it is that like, I get a message on messages and I go, Oh, let me thumb through some responses here. And it's the same messages that I've had, the same responses that I've had for two years. Uh, and, and it just, you know, I, please take my data, Apple, please take it and do something with it. So I I'm like, know. I get, I get the privacy thing. I really do. We're all very proud. Take my data and do something <laughs> useful with it for the love of God. That's true. It's one of those things I do miss about Android. And I, I had some people when I initially started using the, the iPhone 11 Pro, like comment to me, oh, I love Android because it's just smarter. And I agree, it is. It's so much smarter about certain things, like learning what you want and do. That said, the Siri app suggestions are pretty smart. They those are, are yeah. like one of my one of my favorite things at this point. But there are other things about the watch, like, you know, I can use it for like, you know, Apple Pay when I need to, like, mm -hmm. especially if I have my hands, my hands are full and not on my phone. It's usable for that. It's not the best experience, but it totally works. And also just for the activity tracking experience, like setting it up and getting it running. You know, if I want to record a voice memo or things like that, it's all, it's not just that this stuff exists. It's that the experiences for almost all of it, they're very thoughtful. 
Apple has considered them. They tried them out. Wear OS has always had this approach of like, oh, well, we think it should do, you know, things A through Z, but the platform itself has been the biggest letdown and yeah. the chipsets as well. The Apple Watch is very performant in a way Wear OS just isn't. Even, you know? even down to like weirdly simple things. Like if you, if you use this to try and track uh, aquatic activities, the way that when you get out of the pool, it knows that you are out of the pool and goes, hey, rotate the crown real quick to push the water out of the speaker. Like that goes off without a hitch every time. And it, it, every time it does, I'm like, that's awesome. It knew before I was fully standing <laughs> upright out of the pool that I was out of the pool. and was like, hey, get the water out of the watch real quick. I mean, and meanwhile, Wear OS has literally zero awareness of, of what you're doing. Like it can track your step right. and your heart rate kind of sometimes. And that's that's it. Yeah, whereas the Apple Watch is constantly telling me like, hey, you're outside and you're walking. Do you want to like track this or whatever? Like it's very in your face about that, which I like because I know that at that point it's going to track it more accurately and use the sensors more frequently and consume more battery. Yeah. I've also been, I had some issues with the Apple Watch Series 5 on the first few days of battery life, but since then I have not been able to get it below like 45% in a day. It's just been, and I've got the 40, 40, the larger one, 44 millimeter, 42. Millimeter, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that one has been, it's been pretty hard to kill. It is just the GPS model. I don't have the cellular, which I, I oddly re Brett, <laughs> um, just because I want to be able to use an Android phone and still have the Apple Watch like do basic stuff. But Oof. it's it's been such a good experience and everything about it has just made me realize I will Wear OS will just have to be completely done from the ground up. Google will have to start oh, yeah, basically totally. a whole new wearable program. It, it, it is a me, it is a mess. It, it, it is. You can tell, like, just look at all the features that Google has implemented and then just killed, like, one software update or two software updates later. Like, they can't even decide what they want to do. Uh, and, I mean, they've known for years what kind of hardware they have to work with, but they keep doing all these things that just don't work with, with the hardware. And we, we have basically the same, like, the same features that we've had for, for four or five years, and none of them work any better. And the hardware is still just so mediocre and sluggish. It just simple things like swiping, like swiping over to the assistant pane on 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 a Wear OS watch is almost always a laggy mess. And if you turn on like OK Google detection, <laughs> as he looks uh, around um, to see <laughs> what woke up, and so and so yeah, you turn that on and like it'll maybe work one in five times if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah and I will say that the one thing about Wear OS that uh, that has been around for a while and I, I wish would either just be flat out stolen by Apple or would just be made better by making a new watch, the, the gesture system on Wear OS for navigating things, if you got like one hand busy, I've always really appreciated. It doesn't like it, it didn't work super well in its first generation, but uh, like consistently, if I get like an email or something, being able to just flick my wrist and scroll through the email or being able to, to you know, kind of rotate my wrist to get a response. It felt really natural, and it's something that I wish was better elsewhere. I, I do I do consider that sometimes with the Apple Watch because sometimes what does happen is I'm like I want to look at something, but like either my hands like wet or like it's holding something else, and I'm just like I just want to look at something real quick here. Um, and being able to navigate like to notifications really fast would be handy without having to use another hand. So I, I definitely agree with you on that front that said my number one goal with the apple watch as soon as i like set it up after first day was to reduce the number of notifications i got oh yes, yes. Yeah. initially it was just like nope can't be getting email can't be getting notifications for any emails any news articles anything in slack um all this stuff needs to just go away yeah you know i actually feel like android's notification or i'm sorry uh, android wear slash wear os that those notifications when the platform launched were more useful than they are now because now they're all like unbundled. Like I could leave my email notifications on with the watch and it would just show the stack like on my phone. I could glance at it and see what like the most recent yep. emails were. But now everything is a separate screen. And like if I want to do anything on the watch, I, it's either it's either like flip through 20 emails to find that message or just turn off the emails. I think my thing with that has been looking at the watch and deciding what what situation and what context is it a good tool. Um, for notifications. With emails, to me, it's never going to be a good tool. It's going to tell me the subject line and the sender, and that's basically it. And for me, mm, I don't, that's, that's never enough for me to be like really sure I need to like get out my phone immediately. That's important. The phone is the perfect tool for email. It was built to do it. And so when I look at that, I'm like, no, I'd rather have my email live on my phone. 
that's where it belongs. That's where it's best suited. Like mm -hmm. I'm faster responding to email on my phone than I am my desktop computer. Like it's the perfect tool for that. Whereas on the watch, if I get a text message or a, a Facebook message or WhatsApp message, like, no, I do want to use that to respond because my response is going to be like 10, 15 words at the most usually. And I can just voice dictate it and I can trust that Siri's reasonably good at that. Those are actionable. So that's what I've been looking at with the watches. What can I send to the watch that's actionable? If it's not actionable, then I probably don't want it. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, the fact that Wear OS has like a teeny tiny keyboard for you to, I don't know, presumably pound out a whole email on it is, is I think, a strong indicator that Google does not know what it's doing. Yeah, I will say Apple's uh, like gesture drawing keyboard on the watch is terrible as well. Um, I cannot imagine any context in which I would want to use that. Um, and at the same time, I've seen people successfully draw the, the emoji that they want on that thing, and it blows me away. Like, I can never use it for anything useful, but I watched Renee Ritchie be like, oh, yeah, I want that emoji. And I was like, how, how did you even do that? that yeah. That's not real life. Um, one question we got, um, you know, is is the Apple Watch just a fancy, more expensive Fitbit alternative? And I don't think I think Russell addressed this earlier, and I just don't think that's true. I think the Apple Watch, in concert with the iPhone, unfortunately, it has to be with the iPhone. As far as the health insights and the activity tracking insights, you're going to have a better experience unless you are like a super hardcore, like willing to go and ingest your own stats all the time kind of statistics nerd from a fitness standpoint. Like the Apple Watch is great if you want to be very hands off with your health and fitness tracking. And that's, well, I and think, even what's then, if you're, um, that's if you're just using the stock stuff. If you want to be a data nerd with your Apple Watch, uh, especially if you're doing running and cycling and stuff, like the Strava app will give you all of those metrics if you want them. So like when I'm doing a ride, uh, you know, the, the Strava app, when I'm done, I can look at my phone and be like, this is an enormous amount of information uh, about, you know, my, my power output and my speed and, and heart rate and everything. It, it gathers all of that stuff and, and puts it to me in that data sense. But if you're just walking around every day, I don't think most people care. I agree. Yeah, I I, I, I was going to try the Strava app and then I started looking into like what it can do. And I was like, oh, it doesn't really fit my use case very well. But there are still, like you said, lots of tools out there that work on the Apple Watch, which is something Wear OS can't say. Third party developers have been abandoning Wear OS yeah. on Mac. Yeah, now it seems years. like every couple of weeks, like some notable app is like, oh, we just removed the Wear OS app because nobody uses it, which isn't surprising. I think a lot of that is, you know, some of that is at least a result of developers diving into the wearable experience, not realizing what the use case would be, and then deciding, oh, there isn't actually a good use case. So let's stop doing that. And I think that's perfectly fair. Nobody was sure what wearables were going to really be great at initially. I think what we found out is that wearables are at their best when you can assert an extremely tight level of control over the hardware and software stack. There's there's less there's less headroom with a wearable than with a phone. Like with a phone, you can you like you can slap a 5000 milliamp or a battery in it and the Android model of just throwing more CPU cores at everything that has made the phones usable doesn't make sense in a watch. Like you can't do it. No, and I think Apple's really shown that for all of the limitations of their model on the iPhone, which don't get me wrong, iOS is still even, you know, two years later since the last time I really tried it, still frustrates me actively every single day, multiple times a day. I do not like using the iPhone. It is an actively frustrating experience for me. Like it really does like get on my nerves. But the watch is so polished and so good at what it does that at this point, like, I'm like, can I just leave the iPhone in the drawer and still wear the watch and just let it sync when I, I get home? <laughs> <laughs> but then I'm like, oh, no, I lose the notifications. And, I, and I'm like, oh, I should have gotten the cellular model, so I still get those. And it's just, I really understand how somebody could get locked in to iOS with the watch at this point. I mean, because and Apple I think that's, far that's, why, that's why Apple will never let it work on Android. Right. I think they, I, I just don't think it'll ever happen. And they, it wouldn't provide the level of control Apple wants. They, they wouldn't have access to the, the hardware stack on the phone and tight integration in terms of defining how everything works that I don't think, that I think they really crave. It really is, like Russell said, it's ironic that Apple, the company who lets you have so little control over everything, the watch makes you feel like you have so much control over the watch yeah. experience. Is it's just so leaps and bounds ahead of everything else in the in the market right now. It's yep. just years. We're talking, I would say the Apple Watch is three, four years ahead of anything anybody else is doing. I mean, that implies that any other platform has like a, a positive trajectory right now. I don't it's know. That's the worst pointing out that it's three, four years ahead and it's one big feature from this generation was that the, the screen was on all the time. 
Like that, yeah. like it's really easy to mock that from from a high level, but then you look at the rest of the competition and you go, oh, okay, sure. Yeah. I, it's really the last thing that Wear OS had on, on the Apple Watch, right. I think. It, I always thought that the Apple Watch looked a little silly when it was just like this blank black square on people's wrists, but like now that it can be always on, like I feel like that looks nicer. And even so with Wear OS is always on functionality, battery life on Wear OS was always highly unpredictable. Oh, that's what so I always nice. noticed about it. Like you just never knew if your watch was going to last the whole day. Sometimes like, oh, I got plenty. And then like you get 6 p.m. and it's like, oh, it's dead. And yeah. with the watch, it's evened out so much for me. It's like 50 to 60 percent almost every day. I yep. remaining by the time put on charger. Yeah. The, the other day I, I was wearing a, I was wearing a fossil watch and it just decided it was going to freeze at some point in the evening. And I didn't notice until like an hour and a half later. And <laughs> I noticed because it had gotten really warm. Uh, and so I was like, well, that's bad. So I hard rebooted my watch, which was like a thing I don't want to ever that's have. That's always super life. great. That's a sentence you love saying. And, and the battery was like almost dead because something had gone horribly wrong in the system. And it had just been like, like screaming in pain for the last hour on my wrist. And yeah, so, you know, inconsistency in Wear OS is a big problem. So Russell, one of the things that I think a lot of people ask about the Apple Watch is basically about the price. Like the the cost of getting into the watch is substantial um admittedly you know i bought the iphone and the watch because these are company products and um, they're being used for that purpose but you know i've got the bigger one with the milanese band with the standard body just aluminum and with tax it still ends up being over 500 dollars <laughs> yeah um, which is it's a lot of money do you think most people are going to get like a good roi on that experience I'd be curious to hear what you think about that yeah, so I mean the 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 process the the price for you know kind of the out of the box new Apple Watch is uh, is definitely higher than I would recommend for most people if they're if they're looking for like a solid fitness tracker or something like that. Even you know as good as it is, um, but the the advantage of being as far ahead industrially as Apple is right now is that they can also say, hey, if that's too much for you, you can get the Series Four for two hundred bucks cheaper. And that's a that's not nothing like being able to to like being able to recommend that to someone who is curious about the Apple Watch, but isn't, you know, willing to drop the five hundred dollars and still get largely the same experience uh, is is pretty significant. And that puts that price really close to where what are supposed to be its biggest competitors are. And I I think the interesting thing about wearables, too, is like I'm losing the Apple Watch. I would a feel very uncompelled to upgrade. I just would it would the only point the point at which I would upgrade would be. A, the watch starts to experience like crazy performance problems where it's just not reliable anymore, which I think would take a while to really manifest. Or B, the battery doesn't last long enough in a day. And I think you'd be looking at an upgrade cycle of probably four, five years for the Apple Watch, realistically. I see, I hear about tons of people who still wear Series 1s, you know, it which is, depends a lot on how your battery ages. Yeah. Yeah, battery age is definitely a big thing, and it's also important to keep in mind that Apple doesn't really care how often you uh, you upgrade your watch because people are way more excited about picking up new bands. And as you pointed out, with the price of the Milanese Loop, they make a lot of money off of these watch bands. They sure do. So <laughs> like much money if you walk into an Apple store now, it, like there's an amazing third party market on like Amazon and a bunch of other places where you can get pretty cheap watch bands. But most of these people are walking into like a Best Buy or an Amazon or something like that. Uh, and yeah, they are crazy expensive. For even just like the basic uh, watch bands, the margins on them are insanely high. I agree, and it's all if once you go beyond the aluminum case, it's all profit for Apple. Stainless steel, oh, man. titanium, the, the whatever. The stones it took to make their their titanium body an eight hundred dollar watch <laughs> was amazing. If you like people who know anything at all about watches, know that a titanium body does not cost anything more than a stainless steel body for for the manufacturer. Exactly. But I have absolutely seen them. I live in Silicon Valley. Like I've absolutely seen people wearing them already. Oh, yeah. I've seen a couple ceramic ones. I live near an Apple campus. So like, you know, the ceramic one is what, 1250 or is it 1150? It's, it's 1250. It's a lot, you know, yeah. and ceramic is probably not a good watch material, <laughs> honestly. Like uh, if you bang that thing pretty good against something, that's I would be curious to see how the finish holds up. Um, aluminum scratches and dents, but it doesn't crack. So I would be I'd be curious to see how that does. But it shows that Apple has this control now that the Apple Watch has become kind of a status symbol. Like even if you don't like the aesthetic, you have to admit that it's immediately recognized. I see I see so many of them. And I, I mean, I don't live in Silicon Valley and I still see a ton of Apple Watches. And I mean, I don't particularly like the whole square watch vibe. 
But at this point, I'm willing to admit that I'm in the minority. People have have grabbed on to this design and they like it. They really do. And I, I mean, personally, I've become a fan of it. Like I got the gold aluminum body with the black band. And actually, I think it looks pretty cool. Like, but I, I think that's another part of why Apple's been so successful is really not just being able to profit on personalization, but the personalization in and of itself, something that never really worked with phones. You could buy cases to personalize your phone, but it wasn't a display object. A watch is jewelry at the same time. And this is what I said um, on a previous show is that Apple succeeded in making a fitness tracker jewelry. And yeah. without a doubt, they succeeded. I mean, that's really what it's come down to. Like I could have got bought the very basic 40 millimeter, you know, with the, one of the basic included bands, but I didn't of course, because I had already decided that I liked one that looked a particular way. And once you, once they have you with that, man, that is a level of control that uh, that fashion companies have, but rarely technology ones. And all you need to confirm that is to walk into any Apple store and see how much physical real estate in a store they dedicate to watch bands. And if you see even like the box it comes in, like, come on, right. like, it's ridiculous. It's like, there's you know, it doesn't need to be anywhere near this big. Like, it, it's just so nuts to me. They've really gone into the unboxing experience, making it feel so special. Like you are opening a fancy piece of jewelry, not in a classic way, but in a way where it's like, oh, there's something very special inside of this box. Whereas when you open an iPhone box, it's an iPhone box. Um, there's really nothing special about that. With the Apple Watch, they've clearly like really latched onto the tactile experience. Yeah, it unfolds like a piece of origami. Like it's, it's, it is in and of itself, the box is a piece of art. Like it's, it it's is. fascinating. Absolutely. It is packaging art in the way the iPhone box, you know, when the iPhone box first came out, the iPhone box is kind of packaging art, but the watch is like way above and beyond that. You know, it's one of those things where people like say like, oh, Joni Ive, what a kind of lazy guy he was in those last, uh, de that last decade there. And I'm like, nah, I think he got the foundation of the watch like as a physical object and a product like pretty dead on and that was his baby that was his brainchild even if he didn't see the fitness tracker side of it even if that was a later kind of thing that other people took over like as an object and an experience in terms of what it's like to to buy and to hold and to wear i think he kind of nailed it in a way that uh, he doesn't get as much credit as he maybe should for yeah it's true uh, so um, we are running a little long this week, so I will, uh, Russell, thank you for coming on the show, yeah. talking about all these various things, um, the Apple Watch and Essential and everything in between. Um, Russell, where can everybody find you? I am at Russell Holly on everything. Super easy and boring to find. And you should definitely follow Russell. He's absolutely hilarious and very smart. Um, you can also find him on Mobile Nations occasionally. Um, how often are you writing there these days? I, I have seen a couple things from you. I don't write as often as I used to. Uh, I'm actually, uh, I work with Mobile Nations in a different facility. I, I, I am actually training a huge group of, uh, of um, freelancers uh, who are starting to, to work across the network, uh, mostly in like a gaming space and stuff like that. And as uh uh, Jules just reminded me in chat. Um, I also uh, have started working with several of our uh, of our gaming writers for a separate podcast all about uh, like latest video game stuff uh, called Jiggle Physics. Um, Excellent. I'll have to give that a listen. Um, I've been getting a little bit back in the video games recently, so uh, I'd be curious to hear what you guys uh, discuss. Um, once again, thanks for coming on, and also uh, thank you to our, you know, uh, host Ryan and our producer Jules um, for being with us today. We hope everybody listening to the show uh, is enjoying the new format. We, like I said, for years we haven't been able to have guests on the podcast because it's so late in the day usually, and we just don't we're not flexible enough for a lot of people. And you know, we can now have awesome people like Russell on the show with this new setup, and we can get new viewpoints, new ideas, new perspectives. And I hope you guys got some value out of that today. And I hope that if you uh, really liked what you heard, you might join us for a live show once in a while at twitch.tv slash Android Police. We're live Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, usually around noon Pacific, depending. We'll let you know, though. And we also have our live Q&A show still every Tuesday afternoon, which you can also check out. So we are live four times a week at this point, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, thank you for listening, everybody. And once again, that's twitch.tv slash Android Police if you'd like to check us out live. And uh, we'll see you on Friday. See you later.